Just just as a quick overview for those who don't know us, hopefully most folks do, but uh, we are Mobius Partners. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. I've been with Mobius for about nine years. Uh, I joined Mobius from HPE, and prior to that, I was a uh, uh, end customer who ran an IT organization and bought and used a lot of HPE solutions. Um, Mobius, for those who don't know, we've been around since about 2000. We're primarily located in the Tola area uh, with offices in Frisco, Houston, San Antonio, and we have folks in uh, Austin as well. Um, been a big HPE portfolio partner for a very long time. We're a platinum partner uh, and cover basically everything that HPE does in the portfolio from storage, compute, networking, and uh, of course, uh, their security products and services and, and uh, everything else that they offer. Um, we're fairly unique um, from the standpoint that, you know, we're very focused on the customer side and making sure we support you guys and everything that you need. And we're very, very flexible in how we develop solutions. And we have a great technical and account management staff that uh, supports our customers and your daily needs. So with that, that's a very quick high level intro and welcome to what we're doing. I'm going to pass this off to Keyshawn. Keyshawn is a solution architect with HPE. Uh, some folks on the call might know him um, for others who don't. Uh, lots of expertise, covers the entire HP portfolio, uh, but today we're going to be honed in specifically on some of the storage and, and its re most recent um, releases. So with that, I'm going to flip over to Keyshawn and uh, let you take it away. As Rob mentioned, my name is Keyshawn Patel. I'm the HP Solutions Architect. I'm excited to be here today to tell you guys a little bit about our HP storage portfolio as well as some of the improvements and advancements that we've made uh, earlier this year and stuff that we're going to be continuing on as we move forward within the, as the year goes on. So moving on from there, let's kind of kick things off for this is to move forward. There we go. So for those that aren't as familiar with HPE or kind of want to get a bit more information on where we are pro progressing as a company and the trajectory that we're headed with. Um, so as you know, I'm sure you've heard the tagline that we've said numerous times, which is that we're the edge to cloud company. What does that really mean? We're going to be kind of going through a kind of a phase or switch up in the next couple of years where, where I want to highlight is something that we're kind of dubbing internally as the journey to one, which is essentially we're encompassing all of our entire portfolio, all of our services, products, hardware, whatever it be, uh, the GreenLake cloud platform, all under one kind of encompassing banner that we want to kind of leverage that as a way for customers, partners, anyone that accesses HP as a kind of single viewpoint or view pane into what we do and how we can kind of maneuver from there. Similar to how if we want to take a step back and be able to uh, break it down a little bit even further is if you think of it as your, if you have your iPhone, you have an iCloud account really right attached to it. Now, if you have take that iCloud account and you can log into uh, your iPhone, your MacBook, iPad, whatever it be, and you still have that singular uh, looking glass into these different products uh, related to Apple, similar to that vein where you want that single pane of glass um, to be able to be able to access anything and everything HPE, and that's kind of where we're progressing towards uh, in our future-looking statement. So, from there, uh, diving deeper into some of more of what we were touching touching on, we have the uh, GreenLink Cloud platform, which is kind of where our management scape or space will live, and then you have underneath that banner networking, compute, storage, data management services, any type of workload orchestration, whether it be through VMs, containers. Um, security compliance that we're very much well known for, as well as uh, the advisory professional services, managed services through HP or through our partners, as well as being able to uh, perform unified analytics such as uh, AI, machine learning, any type of kind of database management. We want you to have that, uh, all that accessible through one single platform, and that's kind of where we're headed in that journey to one. Now, now I've given you that marketing spiel. Let's actually get into the full-on technical and kind of more deep dive into the hardware and the, the highlights that we wanted to touch on today. From there, I'm going to touch on the portfolio. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over the compute portfolio because we had had some cool announcements earlier this year, such as our Gen 11 line, as well as uh, related to ProLiant and uh, our Synergy. And then we'll go into the storage deep dive from there. Okay. So... We quickly take a look. Um, we'll actually go into the storage first, um, and then we'll go into the some of the other compute stuff uh, from there. But so quickly taking a look at our overall storage portfolio. Now, I want you to take a look and see the 
our main portfolio that we have currently now is that top line up there at the top. So everything from Electra 5,000 or 4,000 all the way over to Electra MP, which we actually announced and released back in April, um, that's now available as well. So that's going to be our mainline uh, platform. So our storage platform is now going to be falling under the Electra banner, anything and everything HP storage. Think of HP Electra. Now, some of our other products that we have that we've had that are still around and still kicking with some of our other customers, as well as some of our more entry-level products that we do offer as well. So we do offer the HP MSA. That's our mainline entry-level uh, storage array system for those kind of smaller customers that are looking forward to get into that scape with uh, that storage sand uh, fabric there. We have SimpliVity, which is our uh, hyperconverge infrastructure, essentially merges the two uh, compute and storage into one singular platform so you can scale as you see fit, both storage and compute together. Again, our fan favorite Nim HP Nimble Storage, which is still around, um, it's just been rebranded into that Electra lineup, which I'll touch on a little bit later. We also offer Nimble DHCI, which is again, that taking that hyperconverged infrastructure that you see with Synergy, but then kind of breaking it back up a little bit, which is where the D comes from, which stands for disaggregated. Now this stands, for, this essentially is allowing you to, instead of scaling both storage and compute together, you can scale each one separately while as you need it. So rather than having to utilize compute resource that or take up compute resources that you're not utilizing, you can then only all you need to do is just purchase extra storage and then still scale from there, which is a really handy tool for some of our customers that offer that are go undergoing certain different changes. They're not really performing with higher compute or they just need more storage. Do you have to be on can yes, sir? Was that a question or? Sorry, I don't think that was a question. They've muted. Okay, perfect. From there, we have our HP Primera, which is our tier zero, 100% availability um, array, which is kind of an evolution from 3PAR. And then that Primera has now been evolved even further to our Electra 9000, um, which I'll go on a little bit later. And then we also have our even more extreme uh, storage performance metrics, which are at the XP7 and 8 which are those for those super high-end um, storage uh, customers that need that really high uh, availability as well as that high capacity from there. So if we go back all the way up to that top line that I was talking about earlier, you have our Electra 4000 uh, series, which is those, if you are familiar with most of our product portfolio, they're the evolution of the Apollo lineup. So our Apollo line went through kind of a bit of a split and transition where the compute dense uh, servers now are falling on, into the Cray banner, and then the more storage dense servers are now falling into the Electra 4000 line. So these offer more capacity while also offering that uh, compute density that you're familiar with if you're you, utilizing the Apollo line. And that's kind of our next evolution. We have for two different flavors, which is either uh, the SFF version or which is a brand new drive type, which is now out, which is the EDSF version, which is EDSFF stands for. Uh, Enterprise and data center standard form factor. It's a smaller uh, size drive, but it does offer the good amount of capacity as well. And it also, as you can see, takes up a pretty small footprint as well compared to either SFF or LFF uh, type drives. Now, moving on from there, we do offer the our new generation of Nimble storage, which is will fall under between the Electra 5000 and 6000 line. Now, 5000 is our new evolved uh, hybrid array. So if you can think of that, being a nimble gen five and a half, and then our 6,000 being our nimble gen six from there. So that's the nimble or the electric 6,000 is an all NVMe, all flash array. Uh, and then while the 5,000 is still that hybrid flash uh, hybrid or with the cache array. So you'll have a, the SSD cache in tier and then um, HDDs for the actual storage itself. <clears throat> from there, again, as I mentioned previously, the the Primera Evolution or three-part in Primera Evolution, which is now the Electra 9000, is kind of that uh, new all NVMe, all flash, 100% availability uh, array that we do offer that allows for kind of more scalability for those customers that are looking for that really high dense um, storage. And then we also are for our brand new um, evolution of DHCI, which is now falling under through either Electra 5000 or 6000. And then on top of that with our new Gen 11 server portfolio. So we offer new Gen 11 servers based off the latest uh, AMD and Intel procs with uh, DDR5 memory, PCIe Gen 5, um, pretty much all the latest and greatest in terms of technical advancements on the compute side. And then from there, we also offer uh, 
kind of more scalability as well since you're getting more performance out of that versus kind of a traditional DHCI with some of our uh, previous generation servers. And then on top of that, we also offer our brand new Electra MP, which we just announced back in April of this year. It did release um, for, for the public uh, back in, I want to say June. So that's now available. If you're, that's something that you're interested, get with the your Mobius account team and then they're more than happy to help you out, get more information on it. But that is essentially kind of our MP stands for multi-protocol and allows you to run either uh, a block OS on top or a file OS on top of that actual hardware. And then you're able to kind of uh, pick and choose as you see fit. Now, the cool thing is if the, or the thing is that we want to look hope to achieve in the future is being able to kind of pick and choose, have both OSs on the same platform and kind of nav flip, flip a switch and be able to navigate between the two, but that's not, the technology is just not there yet. So you do offer that availability. So you have to kind of pick one at the start and then scale out from there. And then if you want to go say from uh, to file, you would have to get a whole new array and then go from there. So, but the, there is something that uh, some future looking thing that we can probably look, hope to achieve out of it, which is being able to have one single box and you can run whatever you want off of it without having to really worry about additional um, footprint take, being taken up within your infrastructure. And then as you can see with those uh, flags up there, uh, they're all managed or found within our DSCC or Data Service Cloud Console in our GreenLake Cloud or GreenLake Cloud platform. There's a whole lot of acronyms going to be thrown out today, so you're ready for a lot of tongue twisters. But that so all those uh, products that you see there are going to be able to be managed remotely from anywhere, uh, anytime. Um, they're also able to be auto discovered whenever you do get that array set up within your infrastructure, which is a really cool thing. Um, so it kind of alleviates a bunch of the pressure of being, having to worry about. Dad, make sure I check this array. If it was configured for something, you can go in, uh, provision it. Uh, it can do automated provisioning as well as um, being able to ensure that the rest of the arrays are in line and that everything is kind of up to date. You can do fleet wide management with it, with this, which is really the cool thing being able to manage these separate arrays if they're hosted at different sites. And then there's also that uh, yellow star that you see, which kind of denotes that 100% availability, which is also, again, a really cool key factor for some. Some of our customers are looking for that uh, mission critical style uh, stored array. And then if we go back to the MP, which we will talk about a little bit later, is that that also offers that scalability. You can start small and then scale up from there. You're still not losing that available, that 100% availability, no matter how small you start and then how high you scale, you're still getting that um, mission critical uh, performance, which is really, really cool and key for some of our customers. So now if we move on from there, let's talk a little bit about the Electra MP, going a little bit deeper into that. And I'm specifically going to touch on GreenLake for file and GreenLake for block. Now, I know you're going to see these this GreenLake tag being thrown around. Again, it kind of ties back to our journey to one in a sense, where we're trying to have everything fall under the same kind of banner and then build on top of that from there. So GreenLake is essentially our a branding name rather than kind of a actual product. But I digress. It's there's a little bit too much to go into for now, but we'll, we'll go back to it at a later point. But focusing on the actual topic at hand, which is the Electra Storage MP. Now, as I mentioned, it allows for that scalability from being able to, you pick either that OS level that you want, either block or file, and then can go from uh, starting small and to all the way up to petabytes of storage capacity. And that's, that's really the cool thing. It's that one single uh, node that you can start with. So as you can see, it starts with the at the bottom right here, you have the electric capacity nodes. Um, you can that which allow you to scale out depending on how you see fit with a bunch of drives and a bunch of uh, storage. You, you can switch it up with the, with an NVMe fabric that allows you to kind of speak to the different controllers and the different capacity nodes, and then they all kind of tie together, so allowing you to scale either out, up, or however you see fit, which is a really cool thing that we do do offer with this. And so with that, the Electra MP does offer um, on the block side, as you can see, you're getting a lot more uh, performance out of it. So with, with that scalability, you're starting small um, and then still able to achieve that 100% data availability guaranteed. And then on the file side, because it's such a, uh, such a, because you're getting that 100% availability, we're, we're partnering with VAST to kind of work in that, that OS and that, that performance that they do offer from there their software and then kind of adding our little spin onto it so that we're able to kind of scale out from there. So 
block is our own uh, HP built um, OS, and then file is kind of something that we've worked in partnership with Vast Data on to help to achieve kind of a more solidified uh, file storage system for, for the customers as a whole. Now, again, let's take a look at kind of where the uh, Electra MP for block will fit into kind of the landscape of our regular uh, portfolio. So as you can see, uh, that block kind of fits in between the 6,000 and 9,000, and that does offer uh, good flexibility. So you can start small, um, as you as I mentioned previously, from all the way down to 5,000 level uh, capacity and performance, all the way up to 9,000 level capacity and performance as you see fit. So you can have uh, a couple terabytes all the way up to multiple petabytes, and you're not kind of limited within that scope. So you can scale as you see fit, which is a a really cool uh, opportunity for our customers. Awesome. And then going on from there, we're going to touch on a little bit about the file. Um, so it's kind of a more purpose-built solution that we do offer. There is some uh, consideration that you do have to be aware of when this is when looking to pursue this offering. Now we do offer that scalability, but when starting out, you do have to have uh, about 250 terabytes on the low end, but then you can scale up to uh, over four petabytes of effective capacity. But that 250 terabytes is that middle ground threshold or that low ground threshold that you want to be aware of. And then again, some of the key verticals that we're looking to target with this file offering, you have uh, life sciences, uh, media and entertainment, uh, HBC, uh, any types of data lake. So anything that is you leveraging large amounts of data, uh, large amounts of kind of media files or anything along those lines. Those are the kind of uh, target use cases for this type of situation. So that's something that if it's uh, fitting to whatever you know, the customer is looking at or whatever you're looking at, um, whatever you have currently, then this is, might be a way to be looking at upgrading or kind of refreshing something we want to highlight. Now from there, I'm going to touch on a bit of a few storage updates uh, related that we just that we announced back in uh, at HP Discover, which is back in June of this year. So HP Discover was our uh, yearly uh, conference that we go and kind of announce most of our new updates, what's going going on, uh, what we're working on, as well as kind of providing more information on some of the stuff that's already out. So there's some key highlights that I wanted to talk to you all about here. So first up is going to be HP GreenLake for backup and recovery. Now this is our backup. Uh, solution that we do offer um, in-house. So this is something that will allow you to back up uh, VMs, uh, AWS instances, as well as now uh, we do offer support for Microsoft SQL, as well as um, some additional uh, AWS instances such as EBS, EC2, uh, now RDS, as well as EKS. So those are now available, but the cool thing is now you're able to back up these specific types of VMs all within a single portal without having to go through different sites or different portals to kind of make sure that everything is up and running properly. And it's all secure. It's all accessed within our same uh, data services cloud console, as I mentioned previously. So you're not having to go through a different site. Um, you can go manage your array itself. And then from there, click into another pane to go into the backup recovery piece to be able to manage it all, um, to back up those VMs, set up pol protection policies and however you see fit, as well as being able to then from there, uh, go into managing. So if we go in here, which is another option that we announced at Discover and that we're kind of rolling out as well, which is Private Cloud Business Edition, essentially is the uh, DHCI manager that allows you to manage and protect VMs on the your DHCI scale. So that again is found within uh, Data Service Cloud Console, allows you to consume those VMs that, you're, that you have within your HCI environment or HCI setup and be able to kind of manage them, uh, mic move them around. If you need to uh, perform any one quick one click upgrades on them, you, you're able to do that. Kind of have your own little hybrid cloud within uh, that platform. So as you can see, we do now offer support for AWS VMs as well. Um, so that's something that we did announce at Discover. And then, so whenever you do go in, you're able to build kind of your own self-service uh, on-demand type of situation. So you're able to go, uh, get it provisioned, get it started up, and then go and see how the VMs are performing. If you need to kind of work on one or something's gone down, you're able to go back in and kind of check and view, view at a more granular level, which is a really uh, cool option rather than having to go to either say either VMware site uh, like vSphere or 
uh, through AWS to be able to kind of manage the separate VMs that you have. They're all found within the same portal. You can see the health of them all. You can see the utilization of them all and maybe making sure that you're um, leveraging the correct amount of resources for each type. And that's uh, something that you're able to do within that same portal. And then again, as I mentioned previously, you're able to go from the, the physical management of the actual hardware to backing up um, those VMs, uh, setting protection policies, setting snapshot policies, as well as any other type of backup policy. And then from there, going to backing up your uh, DHCI instances within uh, a, the same view pane without having to switch screens or switch tabs, whatever, whatever have you. And all it's again access through a single pane of glass uh, anywhere at any time. Um, you can even access it from your phone, tablet, laptop without having to actually physically be within the data center. And so we take a look at what the uh, GreenLake 4 or Data Service Cloud Console pane will look like, as you can see, as I was mentioning previously. So you have the different management options. So Data Ops Manager will be your physical management, um, back from recovery to go in and set those protection policies. Private Cloud Business Edition, again, that's for that HCI manager. And then we also offer disaster recovery through Zerto, which is a company that we acquired about a year and a half ago, I want to say. Um, that allows you to set up a disaster recovery, say if you have multiple sites, you're able to kind of make sure that each site is working accordingly and can speak to each other properly. And then from there, we also offer um, the block storage. So if you're running that MP off of, or Electra MP for block storage, you will go into that block storage tab right there and be able to go in and manage and uh, set up as you see fit. So that's something really cool. And then there's a, there'll be another tab that'll populate on this bottom right, right here. Um, which will be file storage again if you're doing Electra MP for files. So that's kind of how we're kind of positioning most of our, our storage entire portfolio now is being able to go, no matter what type of uh, hardware that you have from HPE, you're able to go into that one single plane and be able to uh, conduct every type of action that you need to do without having to switch uh, from different location to location. That's what makes uh, ease of use for the customer, for the partner, for HPE. We're not having to create multiple different uh, panes or management tools, or softwares, you all find it within one page and boom, you're good to go. Um, that's kind of where we wanted to highlight and be able to transition. That's kind of our forward looking uh, statement, as I mentioned previously in our journey to one, being able to condense everything down and reduce any superfluous uh, uh, kind of migration from there. So from there, I do wanna kind of thank you all for being a part uh, of this presentation, listening in, and I'll kick things back over to Jen to kind of uh, continue further. All right, amazing. I do want to open it up. If you have any questions um, or would like any follow-up from the team, go ahead and drop that in the chat and we'll get you connected to the right people or get any pressing questions answered. So give that just a second. Well, you've got the pros here. I promise I can't answer your questions on that presentation. <laughs> so <laughs> let Keyshawn do that while he's here. <laughs> All right, amazing. Okay, um, then if you don't mind taking down your slides, we will transition into, um, we've already checked off the business. Let's go to a little bit of fun here. Um, we're gonna kick off the second half of our event with our our pro retired pro football agent um so before we jump into this i do just want to say really quickly thank you at lmh experiences we are a small business and we're very proud that each month we're able to make a donation to a charity who is giving back in our communities so this month we are clearing some teachers lists through donors choose um so thank you thank you when you support us it means that we can support them and that means the world now, first and foremost, there's some fun coming. You will be receiving a digital gift card um, to the NFL shop to kind of get some team gear here. That'll be coming to the email address that you registered for the event with, and that'll be coming in about three to five business days. So I know everybody's pretty excited about those, um, but we're going to start chatting about your teams. So I am excited to introduce the real retired pro pro here, um, our Mook Williams, he is going to be giving you like all sorts of details about all things football. So Mook, I'm not even going to try and talk on this subject matter either. Go ahead, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm pretty, pretty stoked to see such a great turnout. And I uh, hope you guys are all having a great day. If you want to drop the names of the teams that you root for in the chat, just so I can know what kind of fans we have in the room, maybe 
customize it a little bit. And if you have any questions about what I'm saying or anything at all regarding the world of football, feel free to throw it into the chat. I know if I don't see it, Jen will hold me accountable and, and uh, let me know that this question's pending. Uh, just a short, short background for me before I get into the meat of the presentation. Uh, my name's Mook, and I was an NFL agent for 10 years. I there were 10 very intense, busy years. I have represented uh, draft picks all the way from first round down to, uh, you know, guys just barely making it in the league, scratching through some of the developmental leagues. So I've been fortunate enough to to uh, represent all types of players, all types of people. Very exciting 10 years. I uh, co-founded a couple of different agencies. One was called Symmetry. And another one is called Vayner Sports. I don't know if anybody knows Gary Vaynerchuk out there, but that was one of my business partners and co-founders. And that agency is still doing pretty well today. Uh, I no longer represent players. I think 10 years was good enough Good enough for me. It, it, it's truly a crazy industry. And it, it would I could probably talk for three hours at least, maybe more, about all my stories from that industry. Uh, but I think I had enough. I still do represent coaches. Uh, I still run a consulting business in the world of football where we consult with various uh, families, players, teams, leagues, uh, but primarily agents. They want to hire us to learn how to not make uh, significant money mistakes. And the world of the NFL player agent is a, certainly a big money world where you're gambling a whole lot of money on players, investing in them, inducing them to sign with you, et cetera. And uh, there's no, there's no guarantee and there's no, uh, there's no callback of a lot of that, that money that you gamble. And sometimes it pays off and sometimes it's a uh, life shattering failure. So hire me as a consultant and I can hopefully help you avoid it. So we, we have uh, those kind of people as well. I'm also a practicing attorney. I've been practicing for over 20 years. I've actually had some, some sports cases come in on the attorney side. I've actually, once sued Don King in the past, uh, infamous boxing promoter, and I've had lawsuits involving three different NFL stadiums uh, that I've been a part of, and more stuff. But I don't want to. I don't want to take up any more of this presentation with the background. We're in August right now. That means NFL preseason time this month. Maybe it's exciting if you're into fantasy football. It's not the most exciting month in the world if you're a casual football fan, but the hardcore football fans are certainly paying attention right now and checking out roster battles. Hopefully a few of you have gotten to a preseason game, certainly a low cost way to enjoy the NFL environment and kick back and not be so stressed about how your team's doing. Uh, but for an agent, this is a pretty insane month. Uh, this is the month where you're most concerned about keeping your top guys healthy and out of trouble and but mo most importantly the guys that you have that you're representing that are fighting to stay on that roster fighting for playing time uh, fighting to stay healthy there is no day off there's no even hour off in the month of august for anybody in the nfl uh, including player agents certainly everybody on the on the teams um, the the busiest time for phone calls is right after a preseason game when players X, Y, and Z get injured and you may represent somebody that is just on the fringe and, uh, and, and needs to be flown in immediately that night or early the next morning. Uh, I learned that very early. Get your caffeine ready. Don't fall asleep late at night because you could miss that call. I'm missing that call. It could, could cost your guy the, the opportunity because they'll just move right down the next player on the list. Uh, a couple, There's a bunch of rule changes going into this season in the NFL, and I've actually printed them out because while I'm aware of many of them, there's a few nuances that I'll probably highlight later in the presentation. But one change is that the roster cut down. Right now, you have 90 people on all the NFL rosters of all different types. You got the stars. You got earlier draft picks who are most likely to make it. And uh, everybody from the sixth round, though, and down, and especially undrafted free agents and older veterans, maybe that have been brought in for a second or third shot, they're all fighting and brawling to get a spot on that roster. So you're sitting next to somebody in the locker room, and you're trying to be buddy buddy with him and maybe work with him to make sure that your offense or defense performs properly that day or that week. But you're also trying to to beat him out for a high paying job 
<laughs> so it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, as agents, we know we're competing too. So most of the larger agencies will send in care packages at the start of training camp. And if you're smart about it, you will have different companies sponsor parts of the care package. So whether it's athletic shoes, different products that companies want to get out there to their players, uh, headphones, that's a big, that's a big inclusion. If you, if you really want a, a premier uh, care package, you got to put in some nice headphones, uh, gift cards, et cetera. So it's kind of, it's kind of like an arms race to impress you know, so the player can be like, hey, look what I got and show it to his friend next to him in the locker room. And maybe his agent didn't give him as much. And now you all of a sudden look better. And uh, that's that's just part of the 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 high, high, high risk, high demand economics of the game. Uh, but anyway, you're, so you're starting off with 90 people and you get the cut down all the way to 53 people exactly two weeks from today. Two weeks and 25 minutes at 4 p.m. Eastern time is when the roster goes down from 90 to 53. For many years, there used to be incremental cuts. You, you go down to 70 or 75. Let's meter and spread the players out a little bit who are, who are quote unquote, hitting the street. That's, that's what we call it when you get cut. Uh, but no, not this year. There's going to be extreme chaos, I would say, when a whole bunch of people get cut thousands of people get cut two weeks from today. Um, if you want to treat somebody nice, especially if they're a veteran player and you're a team, you're going to cut them a few days earlier, at least put them out there and give them the opportunity to latch on with somebody else. However, if you want to keep the player and put them on your practice squad and a practice squad is a group of 12 players that you have in reserve during the, the season that you use to help run practice. And they're the first people you can call up. If you want to quote unquote sneak a rookie that couldn't quite make your team on your practice squad, you're going to wait till 359 and 50 seconds on August 29th to release him. Everybody's got to go through waivers. The later somebody gets cut, the less amount of time that a team, another team has to watch the preseason tape on that player to see how he just did. So if you want to try and sneak somebody through, cut them late. As agents, we're doing the opposite. As soon as we think somebody's going to get cut, we're telling all the other teams around the league that that he's about to be released. And uh, we just want to give that team the extra head, you know, the extra start on watching the tape from the preseason. And that matters a lot because the preseason, what you're seeing right now, I know, I know to the average fan, you watch these preseason games and they're messy. They're not exciting. There's a bunch of people rotating in and out. It's not the highest level of football, but you got people literally fighting for jobs. And if you don't make your team, you're at least auditioning for the rest of the league because all the pro scouts, there's two different types of scouts in football. There's the college scout who obviously spends time going around colleges almost year round, scouting the next draft class, the, the underclassmen coming up and rising into draft eligibility. They're on the road there, but there's a whole other segment of scouts. Those are the pro scouts. So they're scouting other teams for a few purposes. They're scouting players on the teams that they may want to acquire in the future if they come become available. And that's exactly what's happening here in the preseason. Or they're scouting the top players on the other team to, to generate a scouting report for their coaches so they can prepare for that team the next week. The coaches only have time to focus on whatever their immediate opponent is. They don't have time to focus on who they're playing four or five, six weeks down the line. But, but here the pro scouts are out watching all the games. They're trying to figure out who, who's the player that we really like that is just just not going to make it, not going to make the active roster and be exposed to waivers. When you get cut, you're exposed to a waiver system where teams in inverse order of finish from last year will get a chance to put a claim in on a player. And sometimes teams claim up to 14 or 15 players on these final cut down days. What does that do? That means 14 and 15 people who thought they made the team, they're going to get cut a day later. And that's heartbreaking. I've represented players like that where, you know, they think they've made the team. They're going home for a few days. They're going to relax. They're celebrating with their family. And then the, the call comes in 
a day later and i'm sorry uh we had to release you there was somebody who really liked on the waiver wire who we had to put a claim in and i'm sorry uh you've now been released and that continues on for a few more days and with um with the new the new change to the rules where everybody gets cut at once and there's no wave there's no uh different waves you're gonna probably see that happen for the entire week two weeks from now it's it's gonna go on tuesday is the big day wednesday thursday friday uh, and there's no regular season games on Labor Day weekend, so it's just going to continue. Um, I'm sorry, I a little feedback. Though we had a question there, uh, but anyway, as as you could see, <laughs> everything I just described, it's it's a pressure cooker of a situation for everybody. Um, right now, the the rookies and the uh, it's not just rookies; it's people that have been cut several times in the past. It's people that maybe have played in the USFL or XFL or. Have, taken a non-traditional road back to the NFL there's there's so many stories there so other than other than the players that are on big time contracts which is actually a pretty small percentage of each roster nobody's making that much money right now in the preseason uh first year players which is defined as somebody that has never completed an NFL regular season they're making about eighteen hundred dollars a week and then in a stipend and the veteran players make about three grand a week, which that's that's not bad. But, um, you know, they're generating a lot of ratings and generally a lot of advertisement and and, and uh, ticket sales. And that's a tiny percentage of the money that's coming in. Uh, but anyway, uh, for agents, this this was a crazy month. We got out there. We tried to get out and watch our guys play in person as much as possible. Uh, you hang out after the games, after everybody's been showered and does media and all that, and you, and you talk to them for 10 minutes. If they're a visiting team player, they go through TSA immediately after the game. There's actually metal detectors that get set up right outside the stadium. You go right through the metal detector, and the bus drives onto the runway, and they get right onto the plane and fly home. So that means to see your player that's on the opposing team, you got about 10 minutes or so before the – um, the locker room manager starts yelling at you and telling people to get back through security and uh, so they can get back on the bus and and fly out of there and fly home. Uh, if you have a home team player, you get a little bit more time, but you know, it's still a preseason slash training camp mentality and, and there's very little time off. So they have to go home and rest up and get ready for the next, the next battle and the next day. Uh, so there's that as an agent, there's dealing with phone calls, especially those, those West coast games where somebody might get hurt and they need another long snapper. They need another cornerback, whatever it is, uh, at 3 AM in the morning, as I'm sitting here, this, this is where I would be set up. This is my war room. This is my man room. You see football stuff on the walls. And this is exactly where I would have eight or nine different screens set up around the room, monitoring the league, seeing if it looks like somebody went down and got hurt. And getting ready for that call and getting ready to hopefully fight and scrap and plug one of our guys in. Uh, and it, it's certainly dramatic. Uh, but I'll say the worst day of the year for an agent and many players is that final cutdown day. You know, you have high hopes for all your guys. Obviously, every player that's been good enough to be added to a 90 man NFL roster, they got a lot going for them. But you know, expectations and hopes can be shattered very quickly. And there's a lot of surprise cuts where people do well in the preseason, or you might expect that that player is going to make the team and it doesn't happen. And they get called in, please bring your iPad, come up the coach's office. Anybody that's watched NFL hard knocks, it's, it's similar. That's basically what goes on with every team hand over the iPad. They give you a ticket home no. and you're, you're out of there. Um, I didn't know if that was Working a question back. either. Back. <laughs> and if you guys have questions, so most, yeah. I have a ton of questions. So I'm going to let go. you continue. Go, go. And, Hit me with um, one. Let Hit everyone you. drop those in the chat as they're coming up. I want to know like the logistics of who is making all of these cuts. How much staff do the teams have to be able to make these cuts at the last minute? It's blowing my mind right now. Uh, well, oh, by the way, I see. Why did I sue Don King? I represented a boxer named Zab Judah, who I think some of you may may know who are into boxing. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the the uh, the personnel staff, like the 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 personnel side of each NFL team, does vary from team to team. Like the Cincinnati Bengals are notoriously cheap; they have a very small uh, 
front office staff. They actually sometimes ask their coaches to go scout college players in the off season when they're trying to, they should be doing other things. <laughs> and they sometimes have the same guy doing pro and college duties. So they're really small. You get to a team like the Patriots, the 49ers, the Giants, the Eagles, uh, these are teams that have a lot of front office people, so it's a lot easier to make those decisions. Um, you have to have people in the front office scouting your own team. The coaches are certainly going to fight for who they, they think should make it or who they think shouldn't make it. You, anybody that's watched Hard Knocks had, can see that. But what Hard Knocks doesn't show you is the people sitting up in the office, and they have as much or even more say. Uh, and there's a hierarchy. There's there's the pro scouts who I mentioned that really grind and watch the tape and they'll they'll travel around to other teams preseason games and be there in person. They'll sometimes watch it. They'll be kind of hiding in the stands or some teams were friendly with each other, might let them sit on the sidelines. So there's a the pro scouts, but then you got other tiers. You got the director of uh, pro scouting. You have regional directors and then you have the GM. So those are three t a hierarchy of three different levels. And, you know, they're, they're the same as agents, probably more intense than agents. They are crunching every player on their own team, also from around the league. And there's complicated salary cap implications. Sometimes some player who's really good is going to get cut because they're concerned about the salary cap. Sometimes older players get cut because the collective bargaining agreement has a nuance where if you have, I think it's six, six years vested as a player in the league, if you make the team week one you get your rest of your contract fully guaranteed the rest of that year so what do you think happens most of those players get cut and get signed back week two they don't want to guarantee the contract for the rest of the year and they they're going to take the risk that they may lose that player to somebody else because they don't think any other team's going to want to guarantee that contract for the rest of the year too so you'll see a lot of these veterans who did make it out of preseason they get signed back week two um, and just to avoid the team just does just wants to avoid that guaranteed amount. But yeah, the, uh, the people on the pro personnel side, especially this month are sleeping in the office. They're having arguments with their coworkers over the, the 52nd and 51st player. How many quarterbacks do we keep active? Who are we going to put on practice squad? There's a lot of internal arguments as to the small handful of players they're going to bring back on practice squad. Do we keep our own guy because we love them in training camp and we got the gnome and we like him a lot? Or do we keep or do we claim on waivers or sign after it clears waivers that other guy who I can't believe got cut by the Dolphins? I, I can't believe that they didn't keep him. I love him coming out of college. We love what he does in preseason. Let's put him on the practice squad. Occasionally, that creates leverage for an agent when more than one team wants your guy in the practice squad. You can actually negotiate a salary higher than what a practice squad player would normally be able to get. But uh, as an agent, if if practice, you know that practice squads fill up within two to three days tops of final cut. So you 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 have to be on it. You have to be calling. Um, it's it's mentally challenging for us because we're trying to get our guys that have just had their hearts broken and are out on the street and that we potentially invested a lot of money into at least get him onto a practice squad. So he's one step away from getting back into an NFL roster. And and mm -hmm. I personally won't stop calling or texting until the last guy has yeah. some type of a sniff, exactly. even you if it's to, a workout. Yeah. The only issue, uh, which is, you can definitely do it every I don't know if that was, a, I think that was just some background. We've got chatter, a lot right? of people joining and just come <laughs> in. I apologize. That's right. There we go. Somebody knows that. I might see that in the comments. Uh, what progress has been made to, uh, to assist injured NFL players? Um, I would say, um, well, while they're playing, I'd say pretty good progress. Um, concussions are much more respected um, you know, that was obviously a huge story with the NFL, you know, NFL constantly trying to downplay it, NFL PA constantly trying to seek treatment and assistance for their players. So that that's definitely respected. You're not looked down on anymore for that. Um, when you're injured, though, sometimes the team doctor who pays the team doctor, the team. So sometimes that team doctor and I won't name any names or teams is going to make decisions that are to the benefit of the team and not necessarily the injured player. Uh, you have the right under the collective bargaining agreement to get an independent second opinion uh, from another list of doctors that have been vetted by the NFLPA. And there's usually at least one from each specialty in each NFL city. So if you disagree with 
that doctor. Sometimes it's the doctor saying, no, you're good. You can get back on the field right away. And the player is saying, well, no, I'm hurt. You know, I have a headache or my knee still hurts or, or, or whatever it may be. And you want a second opinion from an, another doctor that says, no, you need to continue to heal. You need surgery, whatever it may be. You should not be forced back into the field. But so there's a pretty good network and, and system set up to deal with those kind of situations. There's It still happens, but there's less players being pressured to play when they're not healthy yet. Uh, in terms of retired players when they're injured, that's improving a little bit, but I think it's, I think retired players aren't treated nearly as good as they should. Uh, one reason for that is in this collective bargaining that comes up every few years, you guys hear about it. There's a lockout that's threatened or a strike. It, it, it hits the news and people occasionally cover it. The last time we had a real lockout was 2011. Uh, but it, there's tremendous leverage that the owners have. They're billionaires. And the players, especially in the NFL, you only you have a very narrow window to make that money. You know, the a- average average career is less than three years now, less than three seasons, if you even make it to begin with. So the the, the time, and you know, there's thousands of players coming out each year out of college to try and take your spot. So the willingness to be patient through a lockout to really hold your um, position in a in a labor dispute is pretty minimal compared to the leverage that the owners have so that's why and then who gets the where where do we cut the negotiations the most when we're trying to fight for things we're going to cut it for the guys that are already out of the players association they're already retired they don't really have a voice here we're going to argue more for the future of our younger people or the current status of our veterans and um it's somewhat short-sighted but also there's not a ton of leverage to to get it done, you know, you're fighting a, a 32 or more billionaires that have a lot more patience than a lot more financial means. So that's why that's why sometimes the players aren't treated as as well as they should, especially after after um, they get out of the NFL. How accurate was Tom Cruise's portrayal of an agent? <laughs> that's a good question. I like that's a good movie. Uh, as you can imagine, it's pretty it, it's fairly watered down, but there are some there are some. Uh, nuggets of realism in there i'd say you know they did work with experience and nfl agents when they made that movie um yeah you can't you can't put together a movie that's only two hours long on on what we do there's just too much craziness and but i'd i'd say i'd say from a personality i think he did a good job like just from like a personality wise like there's people you know we've all either acted like that or we know people like they're like that in the industry that character jerry mcguire and um it's a it's a it's a little streamlined and definitely Hollywooded up, but I'd say there's there's some realism in that. Um, it, it was definitely one of the better one of the better movies that I've seen that that covers the the business of football. Uh, let's see if I missed anything here. Scrolling through, Jen, you said you had a bunch. Hit hit us with another one. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm. So- so has the cutoff always been down to like that 55 that you said? I'm really shocked with that. What was the theory or the thought process behind one significant cut um, jumping that many? I, I don't know why they got rid of the intermediate cut. Um, and maybe to take some, <laughs> in a weird way, take pressure off some of the front office people so they don't have to cycle through one wave of cuts. And then uh, and then the next wave was at most a week later. Sometimes it was five days later. They, usually there was a cut right before the final preseason game. And then there was a cut right after it. And I think they probably looked inside and they said, oh, there's really no point to have this intermediate cut. It just generates more work for us. Let's just do it all at once. And if we want to cut down... I, I know some teams will do this, especially the players that they like, that they want, that they couldn't keep what they want that player to get another opportunity. You'll see some people getting released earlier, uh, almost as a favor. Um, I know if I was running a team, if I if I had people that I had no, no use to plug into the final preseason game, I liked, but I knew they weren't going to make the team. I would cut them as early as possible. Let's give them a chance to earn a living out there and not wait to the last minute. Uh, the best players are going to be cut last, though. Um, all right, we got another, we got another uh, licensed NFL PA agent in here. I like it. I almost feel like we should put him on. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Uh, See yeah. you, Fox Freeman. Feel free to unmute if you need to share any details. Uh, and this then- is all... Uh- yeah, this is all. I mean, it's all accurate. The, the yeah, the test to get licensed as a as a player agent um, is very difficult. Uh, I think, and they keep making it harder. I think less than half the people pass nowadays. Um, and the NFLPA does have a certified financial advisor program, um, and they they um, strongly encourage, aka, almost force you to use those players. But that program's not even close to the to the scrutiny that uh, that you have to go through to become a player agent, that program's more like I'll pay a fee and I'll become I'll, I'll now be certified. I'll, I'll pay a fee and I'll I'll go through a really easy review and now I'm certified. It, it really was just a revenue generating um, approach by the NFLPA, in my opinion. We never uh, we never paid much attention to it. We'd have our own way deeper. Uh, verification programs we, we at, at vayner sports at least we hired a third party professional to like strongly vet the financial advisors that we would review uh, we almost never directly recommended anybody we would just simply vet them because a bad financial advisor can really really make life terrible for your players uh, there are some outright criminals out there doing it there's other people that are just bad at it so a good one a good one though will, will assist your player and and not having to work too hard again. Uh, if he's played a bunch of years in the NFL, he can he can get that money and and make it a legacy. Uh, so that's very important. But the NFLPA um, certification program of financial advisors, I'm not not too crazy about. Maybe they've improved in recent years, but when I when I was doing it, it was it was somewhat of a joke. Um, take on the Michael R lawsuit. I haven't had the chance to, to to look at the complaint yet in the lawsuit. I've only kind of read the um, you know the background, but if if that's true, I'd be uh, really really upset. Um, you know, he obviously is it should be owed a lot of money just from the movie alone. Um, I, I really I need to dig into that some more. It's just been a pretty busy week, so I haven't had the chance to to actually look at the the court filing. Um, you know, if if what if what his accusations are are accurate though it's a it's a major shame and i would be i'd be super upset at it and i'm definitely going to personally dig into that because you know this is somebody you, you know the story um it's just uh it's a real shame if that's true uh, and uh i hope i hope he uh gets his due one way or the other because he certainly deserves it and uh scrolling through the teams we got a pretty wide cross section of, of teams in here uh, in terms of people who people root for before I became an NFL agent, I, w- I was a giants fan. You'll see, this is the David Tyree helmet catch right above me. And, uh, but once you become an agent, you can't root for a team anymore. You, you can't, you can't give the giants a better deal when the Cowboys are the best place for your guy. Um, ironically, I did business. Giants are probably one of the teams that I did the least amount of business with. And the Cowboys and the Eagles are two of the teams I did some of the most amount of business with. So you can't, you got to throw whatever, whatever team allegiance is out the window. And now that I'm retired, I haven't been able to bring it back. I still watch the league, but I can't, I, I, I cannot get passionate about rooting for the giants. I think when you see how the sausages are made, you don't want to eat it anymore. So I know what's going on behind the scenes. I still love the sport. I still love to observe it, but I can't get uh, passionate to the level of a fan. Um, I have been on the Jerry Jones cruiser. I've actually negotiated a couple of contracts on the cruiser. And I think I signed one on the cruiser. Uh, it's pretty cool to say you're on there. A little, little feather in the cap. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, if I represented Zeke and Dalvin cook, would I have recommended those choices? Um, definitely to Zeke, because there's no one better at refreshing a veteran's career than Bill Belichick. And he really respects those veterans, especially somebody that's as accomplished as Zeke. Um, and they need a great running game. You know, they're kind of morphing into the old school defense first, run them up, eat the clock type of uh, team over 
over by my house. I, by the way, can walk to the stadium in 15 minutes, Gillette Stadium. And that, that was a real asset when representing players. I could literally walk there and walk home. Um, but, you know, Belichick is kind of morphing his program in that way, and he needs a workhorse. So if I was Zeke and I wanted to run the ball a lot, Heck yeah. And they got other running backs there too. So if he starts getting worn down and beat up, they, they can, they can take the pedal off the gas a little bit. Dalvin cook, you know, I think he was kind of following the, um, the star, the buzz, you know, Aaron Rodgers is there. If Aaron Rodgers wasn't there, there's no way he's going there. So, you know, I think he's just betting on the fact that. Yeah. And I'm sure he had, I'm sure he had other options. I think he's betting on the fact that the jets might be the hot team and, and you're, you're in New York. If you succeed in New York, that's a lot of off-field marketing money that that's coming your way. Um, it's a, you know, high risk, high reward place. So, and those Jets fans are insane. <laughs> they, are, they are nuts. So, and prop, props to all the Jets fans on the, on the, on the call. You guys are unbelievably passionate and you guys endure so many hard breaks. So the next time the Jets really blow up and get big, it's 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 a huge deal and and they have a tremendous opportunity to do that this year. So I think that's what Delvin Cook based part of his take on. I don't know that for sure, but um I think it has something to do with Aaron Rodgers and a great opportunity there in New York. <laughs> that was a nice well, you know, the Jets, the Jets have not had good fortune. I'll just put it that way. Um uh Please take a moment to complete the survey. All right. I'll pass on the survey, but I like you guys. I'll give, yeah. I'll give all you guys a thumbs up. Um, yep, that survey is coming in from us. So um, if you have a chance, go ahead and let us know your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, we are at the top of the hour. So any final last minute questions from Mook? And then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I see a couple about Tom Brady. I think he's unquestionably, unquestionably the greatest quarterback of all time. I think he's proven that, especially that he won another Super Bowl with a different franchise. Um, I know a lot of people might not like him, but he, he is definitely the GOAT now. You can't argue with it. And that's all I got to say. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you have any more questions, I put my Instagram handle in there, Buka Graham. Feel free to DM me a question or two. And I hope everybody has a great fantasy football draft. If you hadn't, haven't had it already and you very much enjoy the upcoming seasons in the NFL and NCAA. All right.